study on and to try to answer in a more a more biblical and with verses and things like that. So if you can think of a question that I can use for the message that night, could you either write it down or just ask me sometime, just come up to me and say, hey, I've, I've got a question that maybe you could use. And we'll use that whole, the message as answering one of those questions that you might have. Does that sound good? You like that? So you think of a question that you think, well, maybe it'll take a little bit more. Maybe you got a, a question, you know, why, why did it take God so long to create the world? I mean, he could have just done it in one day. Why did he take six days? You know, there's a good question. Ah, why, why did he take six days? <laughs> Actually, most of the time they say, no, it took millions and billions of years. It didn't take six literal days. But, but you know, Randy, my, my ventriloquist partner, he looks at me and says, what took him so long? You know, he could have just done it in one day, right? But he did it in six literal days. There's a reason for that. So anyway, if you have a question that you would like to ask, and uh, you think that I could use that for the message that night, uh, you be sure to ask. And we'll, we'll see if we can't fill the whole hour with a very informative time that will answer some of your questions. Luke chapter 17. I'd like to begin reading at verse 11. Luke chapter 17, <clears throat> verse 11, the word of God says this. And it came to pass as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers which stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go show yourselves unto the priest. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answering said, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? There are not found that returned. There are not found that returned to give glory to God. God saved this stranger. And he said unto him, Arise, go thy way. Thy faith had made thee whole. Let's look to the Lord in a word of prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word today. For this thankful person who was so thankful. But yet there are nine who are ungrateful. Father, I pray that you'll use this message to stir our hearts, to learn to be thankful, to praise your name, even through the midst of sorrow and, and, and difficult times. We just pray that you'll use uh, your word today. You promise that your word will never return void, and we cleave to that promise today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. As we look at this text this morning, verse 11 says, and it came to pass, as he went to Jerusalem, he was on his way to Jerusalem. He was on his way to, to literally where he was going to be crucified. In fact, leave your hand here in Luke chapter 17. Put your right hand in Luke 17 and turn back, if you would, to Isaiah chapter 50. Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 50, and I want to read verses 5 through 7. The Lord God hath opened mine ear, and I was not rebellious, neither turned away back. I gave my back to the smiters, and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I did not my face, or I hid not my face from shame and spitting. For the Lord God will help me, Therefore shall I not be confounded. Therefore have I set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be ashamed. Jesus Christ was headed to the cross of Calvary. That's why he was going to Jerusalem. He was going there to die. He was going to be beaten. His hair from his face was going to be ripped off. He was going to be smitten. Now listen to this. This is Isaiah chapter 50. 400 years before Christ was to be crucified. And it shares with us in detail what Jesus Christ was going to face, the Son of God. Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. 
He was on his way to die for the sins of sinful man. And here in Isaiah, or Luke chapter 17, beginning at verse 11, it says that it came to pass as he was headed for Jerusalem that he passed through the midst, through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Some people think that scholars believe that he was on the border, border between Samaria and Galilee. Samaria is a very interesting place. You probably heard the history, but let me run it down for you. Samaria is the 10 northern tribes of Israel, and they were conquered by the Assyrians in 722 B.C. Those lost tribes mixed with other nations, and when these other nations mixed with these Israelites, they became to be known as Samaritans. They were known as ignoramuses, agnostics. They worshipped in a place called Mount Gerizim. These Samaritans were located between and in an area called Samaria. And I believe Dana has a picture that he was going to put up for me. It might come up in just a little bit. But Samaria is, is a place where the Jews ignored. They passed through. They either went to the west of Samaria or to the east of Samaria. They would not go through. They looked at them as ignoramuses. They looked at them as agnostics, no knowledge of a God, no knowledge that God even existed. Their religion was diverse, but yet they had a desire to be a part of Israel. But Israel looked down upon them as a foreign nation, foreign. We also have Judea. Judea is in the south, and it fell to Babylon in 606 B.C. to 536 B.C. For what is known as the 70 years of the Babylonian captivity, and they worshiped in Mount Zion. They worshiped the true and living God. And so Jesus, the word of God shares with us that he was going in the midst of these two, almost like on the border. As scholars debate on where would have Jesus walked. It could have been a highway of any kind because nothing is, is there. He, he was headed through this area for a purpose. Maybe he had a divine purpose. Maybe he had a reason for going there. Is it possible that Jesus knew that those ten lepers would be there? He knew about their need. He knew who they were. These ten lepers who lived in this area. There we go. Now we have the picture. Samaria, Sychar, and uh, they must needs go through. They either went to, to the right or to the left. They would not go through. There we go. Is it possible that Jesus knew about these men? The Bible shares with us much about the lepers. In fact, there is a law regarding leprosy in Leviticus chapter 14. There's also instructions on how to take care of leprosy in Leviticus chapter 13. And then the lepers must wear torn clothes. Closed uh, reference to um, sorrow, ripped, so that people can see that they were unclean. And when somebody were to come close to them, it says in Leviticus chapter 13, verse 45, they were to send these lepers out of camp. And when a man has leprosy, to bring him before the priest in Leviticus chapter 13. And the priests with leprosy were not even to take part in the offerings in Leviticus chapter 22. We know that Naaman had leprosy. Also, we know that there were leper, lepers in Israel. There were four men who had leprosy in 2 Kings chapter 7. Moses' hand has become leprous during the time when he was before the burning bush. To share with Moses that he is the true and living God. Uh, leprosy was a picture of sin. And we also find in Exodus chapter 4 verse 6. The Lord struck Uzziah with leprosy. And in Luke chapter 15 12. A man full of leprosy. The ten lepers of course in Luke chapter 17. Miriam got leprosy. Because of her rebuking of Moses in Numbers chapter 12. Deuteronomy chapter 24. There's a leper also in Matthew chapter 8, Simon the leper in Matthew 26, and lepers are cleansed in Luke chapter 7, verse 22, and uh, May uh, uh, Joab's house 
uh, never be without leprosy in 2 Samuel chapter 3, verse 29. A reference to sin, a reference to separation from God, a reference to the fact that they were to cry out unclean so people would know, hey, you don't want to come close to them. So we have those who have leprosy. It shares with us here that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee along the border because he had a purpose, a reason for going, a purpose. And as he entered into a certain village, now scholars have never shared with us what village that is. The Bible, it doesn't tell us. But we do and possibly might know in eternity. Lord, what village was this? There met him ten men that were lepers which stood afar off. So first of all, as we look at the master in the midst, we want to look at point number one, the master and his mission. The pathway was to lead him to Jerusalem. And as he's going to Jerusalem, we see his purpose of meeting these men, these men with leprosy, because of his compassion, his love, his desire to reach and meet the needs of the unclean, those who know not Christ, the master and his mission. But not only do we want to look at the master and his mission, but let's also look at the master and his mercy. The Bible shares with us that these men were in quite a plight. The reason for their assembly and the reason why they came together is because they were united in this disease. One of them, we find out later, is from Nazareth. Or excuse me, he's from Samaria. The rest of them, possibly Jews, but yet they were united in this disease. They came together. This disease brought them together. They came together even though they were from different nations and lands. They were still together. They were also united in the need for healing. They were sick. And we know that leprosy is a very dreadful disease. The skin turns white. The feeling is, is gone. Fingers fall off. Your nose falls off. Ears fall off. Extremities and toes and, and, and feet. And it's a very dreadful disease. And things fall off until finally it hits something uh, that is vital. And they die from it. It's a terrible disease. They were united in the fact that they needed to be healed. They're also united in the knowledge that Jesus could heal them. They saw Jesus afar off. And what did they do? They cried out. They're also united in the fact that Jesus would have compassion on them. They saw that compassion. They heard about that compassion. And many people were healed because of what Jesus had done. They're also united in the action to go to the priest. They realized, hey, when he says go to the priest, that's what we need to do. We need to act upon it. And they, they were united to that. The position, they were afar off. Look at this. In verse 12, and as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers, which were or stood afar off. Folks, they're far away from Christ. They're far away from God. They're far away from heaven. They're far away from salvation. But they were kneel near They had leprosy. They couldn't go into communities. They couldn't go into town. They were far off. And you know, there's many people even today who are far off. Not interested in the things of God. Not interested in what God's word has to share. Not interested in what Christ has done for us. They are far off. The same thing with the world today. People not interested in the things of God. Not interested in the house of God. The things of this world are far more important than being where God wants us to be and meeting the needs of those who are around us. Meeting the needs because we're afar off. Even today, with the coronavirus, we are far off, aren't we? We're away from family, away from loved ones, away from those who we consider so dear and the world in turmoil and uh, drawing us away from God's love and the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank the Lord for Dana, who puts this all up on the internet, so people that are afar off can at least hear what God's word has to say. That we can hear that, yes, there is hope, and that hope is in Christ. That hope is in the Savior, because 
we don't want to be afar off spiritually. Yes, physically, we're forced to be. Here, I praise the Lord that we're able to still have school, still able to share the good news, and, and that our young people can grow spiritually, but also mentally with school and, and being apart because, oh, it's so important. These people, they were far off, and it was for a purpose. It was a reason. They didn't realize that, yes, Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, could save them from their sin. Their hope was physical salvation. So we have the master and his mission. And then secondly, the master and his mercy. The word of God shares with us here in verse 12 that, yes, they're afar off. And verse 13, and they lifted up their voices. Their voices, they had a shout out, unclean. We're unclean, don't come any closer. But in this case, they were lifting up their voice and said, Master, or Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Jesus means Savior. And they recognized who he was, that he is Jesus, the Savior of the world. But the word Master, the word Master is often uh, means teacher. In fact, remember Nicodemus. He said, Master, thou art a teacher come from God. The word master is, comes from the word teacher. But this word master comes from the word superintendent. He was a master over. He was a leader. He was a follower who kept the, the back ranks together. And, and he is a superintendent, one who looks over a business or one who looks over a school, a superintendent, one, one who is, is above and one who they look to for authority. They recognized here that not only was he Savior, but he was superintendent, that, that he was our help, he was our hope, he was the one in whom we want to cry out to, and he's the one that can help. And so he, they're praying for, for cleansing, for power that only God has, and, and to praise him in the person that he is, the Savior of the world, Jesus, and Master, superintendent, the one in whom we hope for. And when he saw them, he said unto them, go show yourself unto the priest. You know, Jesus heals in many different ways. Uh, sometimes he, he touches them. Sometimes he just speaks and, and God heals them. Sometimes he spits on the ground and puts the clay on a bland, blind man's face. But here he just says to them, go show yourself to the priest. Scripture tells us that if one has leprosy and believes that he's healed, that he's to go to the priest and have him look and observe and see if the, uh, if the leprosy is healed. So in this case, they realized, hey, we, we need to go see the priest. We need to go look at him. But yet they could have looked at each other and said, wait a second, we can't go see the priest. Our, our bodies, but by faith, they turned and they headed to Jerusalem. They turned, and that's where they were going. And as they were going, they started getting feelings in their hands where they never had feeling before. They started getting feeling in their feet and, and uh, body parts that they could never feel before. And, and pretty soon their skin starts to turn a little pink, and, and some life comes back, and, and they realize that they are healed. What an exciting time. There are some scholars who say that here we have the nine headed to see the priest. That's what Jesus told them to do. By faith, trusting in him, and, and he's going to heal them. But one of them, one of them turned around to thank Jesus. Not only do we have the master and his mission, the master and, and uh, his mercy, but we have one who turns around. Look at this. And, and it came to pass that as they went... They were cleansed. That had to have been exciting. That had been something to leap with joy for. This is, this is wonderful. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving them thanks. And he was a Samaritan. This Samaritan, the Bible shares with us, turned around because he saw what Jesus Christ has done. He saw what he's done. We see the master in his mission, the master in his mercy, and last of all, the master and his message. He had a message for this Samaritan. This Samaritan, the Bible shares with us, was commanded by God, of course, to go and, and to turn and to be healed. 
But this, this man, this man who was healed, the Bible shares with us that he was a foreigner, a stranger. In other words, not from this nation. He's one who, who trusted the Lord, a Samaritan who came back and he gave thanks to God. He gave God the praise. The Bible shares with us here in, in verse, uh, verse 16, and fell down on his face. He worshiped him at his feet, given him thanks. And he was a Samaritan, one who was considered agnostic, one who was considered a, a, a dead dog, literally. Did they look down upon them fiercely. They did not like the Samaritans. They hated the Samaritans. They, they would cross over the interstate to get away from them. Just like walking, walking down the sidewalk in the middle of Florence, and you see somebody, and you think, oh, I don't want to see them. I don't want to. So you cross the street to the other side and walk down the other way on the sidewalk so that you don't have to pass by them. You know, have you ever done that? I hope not. But, but in any case, that's what people do. And that's what they did to the Samaritans. They looked down upon them. And here this man, the Samaritan, comes and he worships the Lord. And the Bible shares with us, and Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed, but where are the nine? Where are the nine? Where did they go? Why, why aren't they here? There are not found the, that return to give glory to God, God, save this stranger. Not from this country. He was thankful for it, wasn't he? He was thankful for what God had done. But what about the other nine? I know there are scholars who said, well, Jesus told him to go to the priest. They're just doing what they're supposed to do. But then I draw back and think, no, no, there is a response here. Isn't there some ungratefulness? He, they're thankful that their bodies were healed. But they didn't come back and worship the Lord. They were ungrateful. They didn't thank the Lord. They, they, they didn't recognize who Jesus was. They, 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 they realized, hey, there's lots of stories about being healed, but they were so ungrateful. You know, there's an NFL quarterback and uh, who has won four Super Bowls. He has four Super Bowl rings. And someone from the media asked him, which ring are you the most proud of? Which one you're the most excited about? And you know what he said? He said, the next one. He wasn't thankful for the four that he received. He was looking for the future. He wasn't thankful. His idea was there's joy next day. There's joy if I get this. Joy? No. We need to find joy right where we are. It's as if we're saying, I have learned in whatever situation I am in to be discontent. Sometimes that's the way we are. We're discontent. We're not happy. You know, Philippians chapter 4 says this. Paul, remember what he said? I have learned that whatever state I am in, to be content, to be thankful of no matter the situation. You see, contentment is the inward, gracious, quiet spirit that joyfully rests in God's providence. We're joyful no matter what happens, no matter the situation that we're in. We find joy, and that joy is in Christ. Biblical contentment comes from within and endures through the spectrum of circumstances. Our joy comes from within. It doesn't come from the circumstances around us. It doesn't come from something that's going to happen in the future or doesn't happen in the future. Our joy comes from within. It comes through what Christ has done for us, the hope that we have. This man was content. He was thankful for what Jesus had done for him. And there are not found that return to give thanks to God, save this stranger. And he said unto him, Arise, go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. Not only physically, but spiritually. By faith he trusted that Jesus Christ 
was the Savior. He's his administrator, the one in whom he trusted in. Oh, it should be our goal to be joyful, to be thankful. No matter what happens, no matter what the circumstances are, I can find joy and peace because of what Christ has done. My wife and I have traveled for the last 30 years in an RV, as you know, I've shared with you. And, and I remember this summer, we're going through a very difficult time. And uh, we, we uh, were traveling, and uh, this particular weekend, um, it was hot, it was miserable, and uh, we, we didn't have uh, a generator that would run an air conditioner in our RV. So, so what we would do is we would end up driving all night to get to the next church for our next vacation Bible school. Uh, because it wouldn't do any good to stop anyway. You pull off, there's no electricity, no air conditioning. Yeah, I wouldn't sleep anyway. So, so we end up driving all night. So we're headed across the state of Iowa. And as we're going across the state of Iowa, I get a flat tire. And uh, middle of the night. And, and it's on the wrong side of the trailer, of course, right? It's on, it's on the side that when you pull off, it's right there where all the trucks are passing you and flying by. And, and uh, so I pull off to the side and my wife wakes up. And, uh, and I say, Jane, we got a flat tire. And all the tears started pouring down her face because she knew I was going to be out there in the middle of the night in the dark changing a flat tire on the interstate and, and the tears just pour down her face. I get out and I change that flat tire. And I think, you know, I would be willing to change a whole lot more tires if it meant that I could leave one more young person to the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. My joy does not come from a flat tire or the lack of it. My joy comes through Christ. No matter what circumstance it might be, I know I can trust him. This Samaritan gave praise to God. The other nine were ungrateful. Oh, I pray that we will not be ungrateful. When you think about the ten, just one-tenth, one-tenth, praise the Lord. Just one-tenth. Is that possible in the world today? Is it just one-tenth of Americans praising him today? Just one-tenth? Oh, that we might be joyful, even through sorrow and difficulty, even when the tears fall down our face, we can be thankful for what Jesus Christ has done. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for the word of God today and for the hope that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. As we think about these ten that were healed, and I know the nine went to the high priest, but oh, they were discontent, just like the world around us. Help us to share with the world that we can find contentment, we can find joy in the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, I pray if there's one here today that's not saved, that they'll trust the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior today before it's too late. But I also pray for each and every Christian here today that we'll learn to be joyful during this thankful Thanksgiving time, joyful of family, joyful of friends, joyful of family and opportunity to also to praise your name and to come together as a church and to be so thankful for what you've done for us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. We have a closing hymn. Yep, I got one back here. Please stand and turn to hymn number 161. One sixty one. Oh. Two verses one, two, and four. Pulpit's open if you got something you want to say to God. That's a good place to say it. Hi Mom. <laughs> one sixty one. And here we go. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. 
See, on the portals he's waiting and watching, watching for you and for me. Come home, come home, ye who are weary, come home, earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling, O sinner, come home, verse 2. Why should we tarry when Jesus is pleading, pleading for you and for me? Why should we linger and heed not his mercies, mercies for you and for me? Come home, come home, ye who are weary, come home. Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling, O sinner, come home. Let's do the fourth, fourth verse. Oh, for the wonderful love he has promised, promised for you and for me. Though we have sinned, he has mercy and pardon, pardon for you and for me. Come home, come home, ye who are weary, come home. Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling, O sinner, come home. Amen. Lord, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this Thanksgiving season, a time to be thankful. Help us to be grateful in all that you've done for us. Keep us safe, protect us. And yet, Father, I pray that we'll be able to spend some time with family, with loved ones, an opportunity of, uh, to fellowship, an opportunity to be together and to be thankful for all that you've done for us. I pray that you'll bring each one of us back tonight as we worship you through singing and also as we study your word together. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, you are dismissed. Hope to see you tonight. Come on back tonight. And by the way, those of you that come tonight will receive a turkey, right? Those that want a turkey can get one. And uh, so, so the gospel will be shared. Be sure to come back and uh, take part in the blessing. Yeah, I'm burning up. I thought so. <laughs> I, I, with